Support for Carolina Business Review, made possible by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. Well, North Carolina Appropriations Committee, in an important stamp of approval for a final budget, finally accepted a $19.3 billion budget for the Tar Heel State. And in the South Carolina House of Representatives, members rejected a proposal that would allow state sales tax exemption as part of an economic development plan to win an Amazon distribu distribution facility right in the heart of the state in the Midlands. Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. While politicos quite literally thrash out and hash out compromises in frank and sometimes emotional debates, our overall Carolina's economy does continue to show modest improvement. Later on this dialogue, she is the new director of the South Carolina agency referred to as LLR. Coming up soon, Catherine Templeton. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King & Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded April 28, 2011. On this week's program, Suzanne McVeigh from Avert Energy. Roger Schrum of Sonoco, and special guest Catherine Templeton, Director, South Carolina Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our broadcast. Roger, good to have you here. And Suzanne, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you. Uh, you know, guys, let's start with the... Uh, yeah, everybody's talking about energy, and let me let me kind of frame this without without going on and on, but... You know, Charlotte has put a flag in the ground, and I, I know you live in Charlotte, Suzanne, but Charlotte's put a flag in the ground to say, you know, we are going to be an energy hub. We're going to replace, and I'm paraphrasing to some degree, but we want to replace banking and financial services with whatever this new energy sector is going to be. In South Carolina, you've had Savannah Riverside that arguably has the highest concentration of folks that know about nukes, um, storage facilities, all things nuclear. You've got Scana that wants to build out a nuclear plant, is building out a nuclear plant. You've got USC with endowed nuclear chairs. You've got nuclear um, uh, fuel being built outside of Columbia. Uh, Suzanne, I'll start with you. If this were a nine-inning ball game, um, where are we in this whole development of the nuclear cluster as a, as a bona fide major driver of the economy for the Carolinas? Well, I would have to say probably midpoint uh, through, the, through the game, as you were saying. Um, I think that what's happened here in terms of probably the most critical thing being the leadership, getting the leadership from the private industry, the public sector together and creating a plan, um, the ability to communicate that plan. Roger, coming from public affairs, understands that it's really critical to not only have a lot of great actions, but to be able to communicate those, to be able to get that message down to all the different stakeholders, whether it be the community members, the universities in this case, um, the engineering groups that are out there. Um, so I think that that's been a really key thing. Um, and I know Scott Carlberg from Talking Points has been doing a lot of work uh, to help bring all of the different groups, Charlotte Regional Partnership, Duke Energy, uh, people who are currently involved at a national level, an international level, and a local level. So. It's been pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, Roger, same question. I mean, are we, are we there? Are we, are, are, we're, we're clearly not there for a critical mass to have this as a major part of our, our development, but where are we? Well, 50% of South Carolina's electricity comes from nuclear fuel. So uh, we are there in terms of, if you look at most other states, it's a much smaller percentage. So we've already got infrastructure in place. Uh, now, the next bit of that is, of course, uh, 
the capital needed to build the, to go beyond where we currently are and and that's what that's where we are in the process of getting capital for the upcoming plants that are planned either for progress duke or uh, or for scanna and scanna is along their way and they're working towards that but i think i think that's where we're on the cups of this we're already a large nuclear play within the industry and i think we're just on the cups of uh, the next yeah. level. So, okay, Suzanne, we'll, we'll bring it back. Capital has everything to do with industry and building out industry. Uh, the Obama administration has made a big point about this whole alt energy. They want to redo a lot of the energy uh, policy in this country. Uh, for you know, you can argue that it hasn't gotten to the point yet. But there was also uh, uh, billions of dollars that were, at least the term was being floated around to, kind of fund this this new energy way. And and a lot of that has not hit the markets yet. What's what is the current sense about the money that's either coming from Washington or state capitals, and especially given what's going on with state budgets? Well, you know, I think the money has been um, slow to flow, and I think that you have to look at it. Slower than you, you would expect. I would have expected, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I think that, you know, obviously the global financial impacts of what's been going on have been really key. Um, I think that if people had anticipated a quicker recovery, we would have seen that money flow quicker if our debt wasn't going up at the mm -hmm. rate that it's been going up. So I think... You know, one of the challenges has been getting the balance in innovating the correct way, creating jobs, expanding our uh, energy sources to meet the needs of the future, but also understanding that there is a very difficult fiscal aspect of that. Um, and I think that one of the things that maybe will help the Carolinas be very effective is that they have this strong collaboration going both between private and public and internationally. You know, we've mm -hmm. seen finances from uh, ministers from England, France, Sweden here recently talking about collaborative efforts internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that's going to increase confidence and, you know, get those purse strings opened up a little bit more. Uh, okay, Roger, from, from, with a company that clearly, Sunoco, clearly a, a huge end user of energy, both mm -hmm. retail and wholesale. Uh, you know, Kenna, what, you, what is your take on this? What, you all, I, I'm assuming, are not expecting for any public dollars to help develop an alternate energy source for your plants or whatever you might be doing. So what is a company like Sunoco that clearly has resources? How do you start fashioning some strategic way to develop this? Well, I, I think we ha we're also looking at a balanced portfolio, and, and part of that includes utilizing all energy sources, including renewables. And we've certainly looked hard at renewables in our facilities. I mean, we currently do cogeneration in a number of our paper mills, uh, principally in Hartsville, but also in some of our other locations. And so we view, uh, you know, the use of energy, having multiple different types mm -hmm. of energy sources, but also getting into the renewable phase. And where we're seeing the problems right now is just making that work because uh, obviously renewable fuels do cost more. And so you have to factor that into your cost analysis because you don't want to hurt yourself in terms of competitiveness by having a higher energy cost as compared to some of your mm -hmm. competitors. So, but we're looking hard at renewables. We know there's some aspects of it. We know that we'll probably have to cut back on use of such energy as coal. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at all available sources. So Suzanne, when you are consulting to a Sunoco or a GE or any, call it a finance company, call it banking, call it Bank of America, um, where do you tell them to focus their energies, no pun intended, when it comes to you need to be thinking about energy, not just using it, but, but developing it and applying it in this way? What is the most important dialogue you're having? Well, the, probably the most important is it speaks to the four barriers of adoption of these new policies and these new programs. Uh, the first one is information. So if they don't understand what they're using currently and how they're going to measure the change, the chances of adoptions are very minimal because they have to weigh the return on investment. So the first thing, and I think that you're going to see tremendous breakthroughs, and you know, I really applaud Charlotte in the Epic Center taking the engineering, the smart grids, and helping companies like Sunoco first understand really what are we consuming. Yeah. They know what their raw consumption is and what their raw budgets are, but really understanding in all the different areas and then aligning that with the P&L focus of the company. Okay, so, in, in, in a very quick... But hit the next three issues. You said four areas. What okay. are the next three issues? Um, the next one is, is distribution. So okay. once you identify where this consumption is coming in, you have to say, how are we going to attack this? You usually don't want to put it in your biggest space first or your smallest space because you want to have that adoption payback and you also want to communicate that out okay. to your shareholders. And third and fourth. Um, third and fourth is um, uh, measurements. You know, definitely coming back in, or finance, excuse me, financing, which is really, really critical yeah, sure. as to how are you going to fund this? 
you know, is it going to be fund on a corporate budget, which is something like Kohler's doing. They've created a corporate fund, but they force all their shareholders and their profit centers to borrow from the corporate budget and then pay it back and measure the payback. And finally, the fourth in a word. Um, in a word is uh, the communications, mind share. Okay. All right. And I change management. Have to stop there. I, uh, I want to shoehorn this uh, uh, Amazon.com, uh, this, this decision by the uh, South Carolina House of Representatives to turn down a sales tax exemption to allow Amazon.com to make that. So Amazon.com said, well, if you're going to do that, then we're not going to build that, that, that distribution facility in Lexington, which is the Midlands of South Carolina. Um, you, you look at that two ways, Roger, in about, in about a minute. Look at it as a major employer. Uh, someone who's been in the state, but also look at it as a member of the chamber. And and how do you fashion the decision by the politicos in South Carolina that say, no, we don't care if you're coming or not? Was it a smart, was that a smart call? Well, I, I think it was personally. And I also think uh, as the chamber took the position that uh, the the sales tax abatements were, were not uh, an appropriate incentive tool for economic development. Uh, of course, uh, we think there's a lot of tools that can be given in, for economic development, and there was a lot of tools that were offered for Amazon. And unfortunately, because of our tax structure in, in South Carolina that relies heavily upon sales tax, if you keep taking away from that, that uh, source of revenue, all you're doing is, is hurting the state as a whole. But more, in, more than anything else, we were very concerned about the impact it was going to have on retailers. Uh, retailers are extremely important in South Carolina as they are in all states. Mm -hmm. And disadvantaging one retailer over another just was a concern that we had as a, as a business uh, organization. Do you think there's a longer term chilling effect on economic development here? Again, I think that any state, including South Carolina, has an economic development toolbox that has a number of incentives within it. And I think that those incentives uh, have to be offered and used. You can't offer incentives that require the legislature to approve those things. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, this will be a rubber stamp from the legislature. The legislature does have to, to weigh in on some of those things. And you focus on what you can offer and the, what's best for the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. That'll be the last word. Uh, please stay with us, guys. Uh, coming up on the program next week, we uh, do an encore presentation, and it's well worth it. It is around commercial and residential real estate and why exactly that industrial sector or that business sector has lagged so many other. Why exactly is real estate still still trying to find a bottom? And then in two weeks, he is the North Carolina Speaker of the House. His name is Tom Tillis, and he has a definite idea for the direction of uh, North Carolina and beyond. And then in three weeks, he is the CEO of Auto Bell Car Wash CEO. Chuck Howard will be here. You know, with the seismic changes in business these last few years, there has been a correlated and direct response in the increase in the amount of regulation and compliance for organizations of all sizes. You can't get much closer to the center of that debate than with the Palmetto State's Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation. Joining us now is Governor Appointee and Department Director, former Char Charleston Attorney Catherine Templeton. Madam Director, welcome to the program. Thank you. You are smiling in a regulatory state agency. That's just an amazing thing right there, Catherine. Um, Catherine, let's start with this Boeing thing. I call it this Boeing thing. But uh, the uh, NLRB Labor Relations Board has filed a complaint um, that says Boeing is uh, I'm using, and, and how do they use this? You're going to know this better than me, but they... Uh, I, I, I can't think of the term now, of course, it's, it f flies by me, but basically that they're moving jobs from Seattle to the low country in South Carolina, and that's illegal, and they want to do it just because they're trying to end run any type of organized labor. Um, what do you say? Well, you know, right now the Obama administration is sort of running the show. The attorney who filed that charge was an appointee of, the, of, of Obama underneath the Vacancies Act. So he was not even vetted by Congress and can sit until Obama leaves office. Um, just like the two board, board members who will come up for reappointment um, at the end of August, at the end of the session, mm -hmm. Obama could make um, appointments while Congress is out. It's a very, very um, liberal board. They're very pro-union. If the shoe were on the other foot, if, if the law had favored the unions, you won't find any enforcement that way. Um, not that the law is, is favoring, um, you know, is, is hurting the employer here. It's really, I hate to use the word frivolous lawsuit or frivolous charge because people bandy that about so often, um, but it really is a political football, and the only response 
if there was some real private right of action, if there was some real violation, other means would have been used well before now. The NLRB simply doesn't have the enforcement authority to pick up the, um, the assembly line mm -hmm. in South Carolina and make Boeing do anything with it, certainly not move it back to Washington. Is there, is there a chilling effect, again, to use that term, is there a chilling effect on uh, not Boeing, but maybe another major manufacturer is looking at South Carolina. Would this affect any type of economic development, in your opinion? Absolutely not. You Quite to the contrary. Um, I believe the governor, I've, the governor and I have made it clear that it's a right-to-work state, that we will protect that. Um, it is the law. It's ours to enforce. And while there is another lawsuit trying to chill our speech, um, the fact is that the law is the law. And for all of these other industry um, all these companies to hear that we intend to stay that way. In addition to the vote um, during the last general election where the actual citizens of South Carolina, those who would be voting in a, in a union election said overwhelmingly, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want unions to have secret ballots. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a vote of confidence for, for non-unionization and that lack of bureaucracy. Um, companies have been calling left and right and saying we like the way you're doing it, we like the way you run your railroad, how can we get in? Is, is, the, is the lawsuit that you're referring to the International Association of Machinists who are, are actually suing the governor for being, I'm paraphrasing to some degree, but being progressive about coming out against unions? Yes. Okay. All right. Well. And me. <laughs> and, and you. Me individually. It was basically our press conference when she appointed me. They didn't like that she said, you know, she's a union lawyer and she, you know. Were you surprised unions. by that with your union background? The, surprised by the charge? By, by the charge and by the response so quickly. Um, not by the response. I mean, you know, you've got to rattle your, your cage and you've got to yell out if you've got no bite. You've got to bark. I was surprised. Um, initially, there was a charge to LLR about that as well, about mm -hmm. the press conference and about our speech. That surprised me because they don't have any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But it was um, quickly um, revoked by Donna DeWitt, who's the AFL-CIO um, head in South Carolina. I think she kind of realized... I won't speak for her, but it was, it was, yeah. they, they withdrew it. Okay. Suzanne, question? A question for you, Catherine. Um, after reading about uh, winning this opportunity and the job creation, you know, if you look at uh, South Carolina and North Carolina, for that matter, we're still in the highest third of the U.S. in terms of um, unemployment. And that was such a windfall, uh, direct creation of jobs and construction jobs. I'm curious what your thoughts are of why people would be spending so much time on this when you're clearly operating within the law. It's a sexy topic. It's that simple. I mean, that may be not the politically correct thing to say, but, you know, it, it is, there, people feel passionate one way or the other about unions. You know, some have grown up with them, some have grown up without them. In South Carolina, most people have grown up without them. Um, we've only got 4.6% um, of our workforce unionized in South Carolina. We have great companies like Sunoco and Milliken and Boeing who create a safe, um, productive, efficient workforce where people don't see a need for that. And so when they're pushed, they push back. Um, you know, and, and in addition to that, I mean, the, the governor is, is, is so pleased and, and readily will tell you, you know, the first time in two years we've dropped below um, double digits in our unemployment. You know, we're finally down, at, you know, in, in the nines. And um, I think it's in large part due to the fact that South Carolina has, a, has an intelligent workforce. Uh, has a positive workforce, and you know when we can attract the Boeings and keep the Sunocos. Director Teplin, let me go to a less controversial subject: immigration. Um, <laughs> of course, you have responsibility for immigration as well. And and as a business, uh, you know, there's always a concern of both federal and state regulation with regards to immigration. There is an immigration bill that is going through the the state legislature. Do you feel you currently have the tools necessary to? deal with immigration issues within South Carolina? I think that you can, you can hit immigration in so many different ways. Um, fortunately, at LLR, we are an administrative enforcement function. And um, neither myself or the governor are in favor of more regulation or more burden on employers. And in fact, the current law has a safe harbor provision. If employers e-verify, which they, is the easiest way sure. to comply with the federal law, then we go in, you show us, you know, your one page, you've verified, and we're out of there. Um, so really, our particular function is only catching the bad actors. You know, we're only, we're only burdensome on the people who need us to be burdensome. Um, the 
pending legislation has more of a law enforcement component to it. And I think that's another way in which you um, discourage immigration or the settlement of unauthorized, um, sit or unauthorized workers in South Carolina. Um, at least one professor in, uh, at USC who's not in favor of the pending legislation at least credits LLR's efforts for reducing the population of illegal immigrants in South Carolina. Well, and let's take that a step further, uh, Madam Director. You've got this, you know, to your point, people look at LLR, and I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I, I think that, that you'll see what I'm saying here. They will look at LLR like, oh, my gosh, it's like banking. Uh, here come the auditors right. again. We've got to jump through hoops or we've got to do something. So how can you go from being um, that way to more of a progressive type of agency that says, let, let us help you how to figure this out? And, and I guess on, on top of that, and this is probably a way too deep of a question to ask, you are inheriting an agency under Mark Sanford that had some successes but was languishing. And I don't think anyone would argue with that. So as you kind of work through this agency and figure out the efficiencies and restructure and try to get it going in a good direction. Strategically, how do you think LLR really should be in the lives of South Carolinians? I don't think you should know that LLR exists. I think it should be that invisible. We regulate every profession and occupation that has a license except for lawyers in South Carolina. That ought to mean to those 300,000 people that once a year, once every two years, whenever their license is renewed, they get a flash email that says, need your visa, pay your fees, and they're done. Mm -hmm. That is not how it's running right now. Before I leave, I hope to have it running that way. Um, that is one of my two goals is e-commerce. Um, you know, the other thing is I, I came from a background of um, private industry. My first job was with Milliken. Um, you know, I've always represented employers and large companies. I don't like regulation. You know, I may be, they, they called me the regulatory czar in one press release um, right after my appointment, and it made me nauseated. <laughs> I thought, well, boy, that's not, that's not going to work. Um, the governor and I are both anti-red tape, no more red tape, reduce red tape. There's a line there between the reduction of red tape and losing the protections that you need for the South Carolina mm -hmm. citizens. Obviously, the medical board of, of examiners needs to exist. You know, you need to know that your doctor's got a license. That makes sense. There's, there's more red tape and more regulation that you could grow that I think, is, I think that's happened mm -hmm. in the past few years. And, for example, with immigration, the, the marching orders for our immigration inspectors is go in, get what you need, and get out. Be polite. Hand them a business card, not a badge. You know, identify yourself. You know, you're a guest there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not the big bad government beating down the door to catch you doing something. Yeah, Suzanne. Um, question, you talked about technology, and I was wondering what specific uh, technology approaches do you think can help you get to that e-commerce state? Well, it's interesting that you ask that. My very first, um, before even the full Senate had um, voted on whether or not I should get this job, um, I left my subcommittee hearing, was told that I probably should stay around and shake hands, and I said, I got to go to the agency, I've got a meeting. Call me while I'm in the meeting. If I don't make it, I will happily go back to Charleston. If, however, you know, you've voted me in, we've got to deal with this. There was a computer contract in place. Um, at the end of the day, probably a $3 million contract. It had been weaving its way through the agency for a couple of years. And $2 million into it, we don't have a functional computer system. It was meant to send out a reminder, give me your visa, and off we go. The problem is, is that every board and, and, and um, profession has different, different eccentricities, and there was no scale of economy, and I, I think that the company came in and didn't know necessarily how to deal with it. So we've just backed off of that, and we're having to start from scratch. Uh, Director Templeton, that's going to have to be the last word, but we'll have you back because I know there's plenty of things we can talk about here. Uh, thank you for being on the program. Thank you. Good to see you. And Roger, nice to have you here. Good to thank see you again. You. Appreciate it. Suzanne, welcome. Thank come you. back. Hope Ooh. you'll come back. We didn't scare you off. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching our program. If you'd like to comment or, or join the dialogue or watch past programs, you can certainly do that. Go to carolinabusinessreview.com. It's not the shortest name, but it'll be well worth it if you can punch it in, carolinabusinessreview.com, uh, and comment or make suggestions on programs. Um, until next week, uh, I'm Chris Woody. I mean, we hope all your business is good, and thanks for watching. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton.
an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. Additional funding provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services. With more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by viewers like you. Thank you. You may write us at Carolina Business Review, 3242 Commonwealth Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205.